welcome back to another Lady Leader series, though it's for everybody. Um, you know, this one is actually a super fun one for Ash and I because it is actually how we met, and that is in the creation of a DA school. And so we're going to be talking about when does owning a dental assisting school in your office, when does it make sense? Um, when maybe it actually doesn't, when you're ready to do it, when you're not ready to do it. Um, so we're just going to be dissecting a bunch of that. But yeah, we'll start off with, right? Isn't that how we met, Ashley? It is. And I uh, I have two very fond memories. It's when you uh, started your DA school and I helped you through there. And then you joined the mastermind. And that was, again, you you were You've just grown so much. I'm just so proud of it. amazing. Dr. Sh yeah. Shaking like a leaf with both. I was shaking with both. Can I do this? Yeah. Yeah. And, so. uh, yeah that's how it got started was you, you um, signed up with Dr. Costas's. That's where, you know, he, he was doing before horizon school yep. of dental assisting and my first real job with him. And here we are now. Yeah. Which is funny. Cause you've grown so much too, right? Oh. Like, yeah, I'm like, gosh, I don't even remember eight years ago or whatever it was. So, oh, we're at, uh, oh yeah, I was gonna say 11 with him, but yeah, I think eight or so with with you in the school for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So Ashley and I met because I purchased when Dr. Mark Costas was doing the curriculum. I purchased that, had her help me through the program, and a couple of years ago when he decided to kind of move on, I I had redone the curriculum because things get antiquated. That's what happens. And so, you know, it's always changing and, and dental assisting and states are always changing what they want. So I redid the curriculum, kind of updated everything. And now we have this program that we actually sell to doctors across the country to be able to start their own schools. But, you know, we're going to really dig into starting out, you know, Ashley, when and you know this answer as well as I do, when does it make sense for somebody to start thinking yeah, I think a dental assisting school here in my location, running one would actually be smart. Um, I mean, things off the top of my head I'm thinking of are when you, A, you, you have good team. Um, you, you know, you can absolutely do this as an owning doctor. However, we all know how much owning dentists have on their plate already. Um, so, I, you know, we always recommended having at least one great assistant um, who's willing to help with the, the teaching and willing to help with the admin side of this project. Um, so that, and then also when you, you know, you have a, a solid space to use too. So you have some lecture room, you have some operatories that you can use, um, and you're just noticing, you know, maybe the you're just wanting to take advantage of the downtime. You know, these things are happening in the evening hours or on the weekends. Um, if you're just wanting to maximize that, you know, you're already paying rent or already paying a mortgage on the place. So, you know, let's maximize the downtime. Yeah, absolutely. You hit pretty much everything. You know, I think back to when I started. And for me, the number one thing was I couldn't get good dental assistance. Um, <laughs> I could not get them. And where I lived it felt like we were recycling all the same, like not so great ones. And for me, I was just like, gosh, I can't get any good ones. And then what I found was two hours, both West and East of where I live, they had dental assisting schools, but they were all like anywhere between six and 12 months. They were 10 to 20 to, I mean, upwards of, you know, $25,000. And I would get those girls into the office because they would actually choose to shadow. And I remember it, and it was no fault necessarily to them. That's not what I'm saying, but they were really unprepared for that much schooling and that much cost. They were really unprepared. So for me, what I had found is I had a desperate need. I saw that what the traditional model was, what they were doing, it wasn't working super well. Um, I did have some assistants that I knew were eager and kind of hungry to have something of their own. And so for me, it was kind of a fun adventure to be able to do something like that with them. Um, and I wanted to be able to grow dental assistants within my own practice to my own culture fit and then handpick the ones that for me just did really, really well. Um, and it was, you know, for me, it was kind of a labor of love in the beginning. But, you know, after that first class or two, it became something that really did and continues to spin off some some of our very favorite team members. So I think if you're sitting in a space where any of that resonates with you, and then I love, yes, it does maximize your space. And you don't have to have 
I mean, three ops is fine. Two, I mean, you just need to have enough ops to put some students in, whether it be your waiting room or your break room. You just have to have space for students to be able to sit and do some of the either lecture material or any of the coursework that you may have. Um, but if you're looking to maximize that space, yeah, what Ashley said is is right on. You know, this is a great way to do that. Um, I'm trying to think, yeah, a big one that I always say is I wouldn't necessarily think about starting it if you don't have any help. You don't have anybody who can help commit to the process of the paperwork and things like that. They don't have time to dedicate to, you know, even though the curriculum, which we'll get into, is mostly online based, there's still time that, you know, within the week that they have to dedicate to teaching and, and admin and things like that. So I wouldn't suggest starting it if you don't have any of that. Do we leave anything? Um, yeah, and I think just going into it with the mindset that this is starting a new business. So the biggest hurdle is our state requirements. So um, you know, there's, there's a lot of hoops to jump through with starting a dental practice. And this is its own business too, with its own hoops to jump through. And the very first initial step is, it's not like a step, it's like a step <laughs> to get your state, <laughs> um, approval to run a private post-secondary school, which however, there are a ton of systems that I know you have. And I know that, you know, we come up with to make it easier, but you just have to, again, be willing to dedicate the time in to doing the things. Cause even with someone guiding you, um, whether, you know, it's, it's your team or, or whatever that looks like it's, it's someone has to be able to put in the time to sit down and, and create a catalog for a dental assistant school and, you know, what that looks like and, and figure out the details, uh, around that getting business licenses and all those fun things. So, you know, in case anybody's not quite sure what Ashley was just saying is, you know, the process to start the dental assisting school is definitely laborious, if, if I could say the word. It's just, it's about a four to six month process of just paperwork, nothing hard, nothing that somebody can't do. Oh, it's, it's just tedious. It's tedious and it's consistent and back and forth with the state. The good news is, is with the curriculum that's, you know, that we have that you can purchase, yes, you get help walking through that program by one of our, you know, our, our people that actually have done this consistently. So they're good at it. But what I tell people is they can't do it for you. You're still going to have to have an admin person that can go back and forth with Melissa or Amanda or Sarah and actually, you know, help with the paperwork. Um, they can't do it for you. And I say, because it's things like you just said, like banking information and, you know, really private stuff that you need to start this business. It's not hard. It's just laborious. And you can expect that time commitment to be, like I said, the shortest, believe it or not, actually, we've seen it, was a super committed doctor in Kentucky who I think was through the paperwork, through the state, and had their license in eight weeks. Um, wowza, right? Wow. I think that says a lot about my team, but a lot about the state of Kentucky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, but you can expect it to take a little bit of time to get it through the state, to go back and forth with the state. It's not a quick thing. And so I love that you said that the process to get the school is a little laborious. Once you have the school, you've got that, that license that you were just talking about from the post-secondary education board of your state. Once you have that, you then, the, the running of the courses is actually really easy. Simple. It's so simple and we've made it so simple for everybody. But that being said, it's the process of getting that license that you were referring to. That's not an ongoing process. That's kind of the process ahead of time. Um, and that's something that I know Melissa, you know, who kind of heads up the program, she's really adamant like you were about, about it, you know, really adamant about be prepared to spend that amount of time um, cause people of course want everything fast and states just don't always move fast. So <laughs> yeah, and I'm adamant about it because I had doctors I work with who, you know, purchased the program and then they were like, well, I just don't understand you said, and I was like, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought this was a done for you. No, well, no, no, no. I still yeah. need your help. And also like this, I can't control the state of Texas. Like no. I just <laughs> no, and Texas is a nice state, and we still can't. Exactly. Control them. Texas yeah. <laughs> you and I both know the states that are kind of mean states. 
part Texas, yeah. Um, we're just kidding. There's just some states that maybe don't allow it. Like North Dakota doesn't truly just doesn't allow the program. Mm -hmm. But my team is able to just check and see if your if your territory is available. Um, because one thing that we don't want to do is sell that curriculum to a doctor that's two seconds away from you, you know, that's down the block. We want to be, you know, make sure that there's a definite 150, 200,000 people that you'll have access to consistently and just you. Um, so my team can check the territory to see if your state allows it, if your territory is available and um, how difficult the state might be. There's some states that are not a no, they're just really hard. Um, and they just take a while. So they do let doctors know like, hey, you're in a state that it's just going to take a little bit longer. So yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of what to expect on the front end. We sure. help you through the process. You know, we can help aid you get through there. Melissa and her team do so much great work, but you're still going to have to be involved or have an admin person yeah. get involved. Can I touch on uh, one more thing too on the front Please. end? Uh, things that I, I think that sometimes again, it's like a business, right? So when you're, you're choosing a location for a dental practice, you're looking at competition, right? You're looking at the other, you know, how many, how saturated is it? Um, sometimes, like you said, there are other programs around you. Um, and, uh, as you mentioned too, your program, you know, you're, you're selling, uh, or your, uh, your tuition for students is at a much lower barrier to entry. Um, when I was doing the program, it was usually about $3,500, maybe $4,000 uh, per student when all, you know, junior college programs or even dental assistant specific associate programs are, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So you want to be comparing other programs around you to see what is happening. There are other programs that are outside of what uh, Dr. Summer does to, you know, assist to succeed um, and a few other ones that have similar type programs that are lower barrier to entry. And, you know, you want to make sure that they're what type of competition is around you and what you're looking at. Um, I always say, if you do have junior colleges and larger programs, like that is choice, like, <laughs> because if they're selling a dental assistant program at 18 months and 10,000, $15,000, Ooh, guess what, baby? I got yeah. one for 13 weeks and it's $4,000 and you're going to have, I can almost guarantee you're going to have a job. Like yeah. it's, finish the program as long as you graduate successfully. <laughs> yep, exactly. And that's such a good point is, you know, when you're looking to build one, just check out your competition, see what they're doing. Um, see, also make sure you're comparing apples to apples because some of them are all online and there's no hands-on. Well, that's not the same as what this program is going to be, which we'll, we'll kind of talk about here just in a bit, but such a good point when you're looking to build one, um, you probably know already, but it's always good to just check what's going on. I know I did when I started one. Um, but yeah, like Ashley was saying just a bit ago, it's also important to recognize it is its separate business. Sometimes people have asked, you know, do I run it through my office? And I'm like, it's its own EIN. You set it up as an LLC. It has, yeah, separate payroll, separate website, separate marketing, separate credit card. Um, you do have to have a surety bond in most states. Um, that just says, you know, to the state that you're not going to run away with your students' money and not be a true legitimate DA school. Um, often the insurance that you have on your practice for, you know, if people trip or fall or whatever, that's the same insurance that often can be extended to your DA school. They just add um, potentially a little more to the premium. That's usually the cheapest way to do it, but you can have a whole separate insurance if, if your agent suggests that. Um, you can also have, if you own the building, you can have a rental contract with the building, talk to your accountant about how you want to incorporate this entity. Um, there's some really big benefits, by the way, too, to having it as a separate entity running through your office for many reasons. That's so, paying you rent? Is that... <laughs> it is. And what you choose to have that rent paid at that's where your accountant can come in really handy with figuring out how does this make the best sense. So please know that it's not hard to do any of that. As we all know, setting all of that stuff up is pretty easy. It's just something that you probably need to ensure that you have time to create that. Um, another thing that's really exciting is when it comes to the website and marketing, we just partnered with CMO just recently so that Ryan Gross and his company can make it to where websites are going to be quite a bit less expensive for anybody with us so that they can just make websites that are, you know, just what you need. Cause I know I, I went through a lot of different things trying to figure out what would work. 
this has just made it to where if you're looking to, you know, quickly have something website wise that's going to work, that's going to have everything you need on it, it's going to be lo less cost. Um, that's something that we've now partnered with somebody to help you with as well. That's one of the biggest things we got was websites and marketing. That's awesome. <laughs> How to do it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's everything you need to have done ahead of time. So expect a four to six month process, depending on your state. In the interim, you're getting all that stuff set up for, you know, the separate business. Once, once you've signed up and you've, you know, paid the, the money, the box will come to you in the mail. And it really is like a DA school in a box, I joke, um, because you're going to have everything you need literally written out. We have made it step by step. I actually recorded videos of how to do it. We have a checklist for how to lay everything out. Truly everything is set out for you. But what I tell people is you've got to open the box. And while you're waiting for your state to actually accept, um, you know, your licensure, you've got to like look through the box and see what's all in there. Don't wait. What I sometimes find is we get the panic calls. I don't know about you, Ash, but we get the panic calls one week before. Our class is starting next week. What do we do? And I would say like, if really once the box shows up in your, in your office, if you start reading through it, you're going to have a really, really good idea of what to do ahead of time. So in that box, what you'll find is the recordings for your students to be able to watch. For us, it's 50% of the curriculum is actually taught online. They're watching it from the comfort of their own home. Um, so that way we don't have a teacher come in and actually, you know, doing the lecture. It's just all online. If you want to record your own for some reason, you can, but that's done for you. That's not where the magic's at anyway, I tell people. <laughs> Believe you me, that's what we have to do to kind of get through the states. Yep. It's the, and you'll know by the curriculum itself that you can tell it was made to almost get through the most amount of states. The real magic comes- <laughs> Are you saying that you don't have to know the exact bones of the head to be the a for Raymond's? And the, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh man, oh gosh, and every oh so much radiography stuff. But um, but yeah, so you'll notice like when they watch those videos, that's not going to be what's going to just be the magic maker. What the magic maker is is when they come in to do the lab portion with which all of this is written out for what to do in the labs. That's when you take those magic DAs or really any other team member that can teach that section. That's when they can really put, you know, all of the wow on it. Um, and I have so many offices that are like, well, what if my office is kind of heavy in ortho or surgery? Can I actually take that section and like talk about even more during the lab portion? I'm like, you can do anything you want at that point. Um, I have a couple coaches who, um, and I won't necessarily mention names, but the, it, truly he was like, my offices are really ortho heavy. Can I teach like Itero and, you know, Invisalign, but also brackets and all of this. You can teach all of that to your heart's content during the lab section, because especially if you're looking to pick them from your, um, your own classes, you'll want to do that most likely. So you can actually take the lab portion and make it what you want. We give you the outline, we give you what you kind of need to cover, but then you can embellish and talk about kind of whatever you want within every section. Cause there's oral surgery section, pedo section, hygiene section, you know, ortho section, pros section. So in all of those sections, you can kind of teach it exactly how you want. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to think. So that's actually the curriculum itself and what comes in the box. All of that's done for you. You're going to be looking ahead of time so that you're ready when that first class starts to kind of know what to do. Um, did I leave anything out as I was talking that made you think? Um, I don't, I don't think so. It's just, again, understanding the curriculum, making sure you're confident in what you're teaching, you know, and it, um, sometimes that makes people nervous too. I love that there's a whole set of online videos, but, uh, but I, I think if you, you know, you think of it as, as, you know, training, like you would kind of, uh, employees, that type of thing. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I don't think it, it can, it's, I don't think it's intimidating or scary if you kind of think of it that way too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times, yeah, doctors will ask like, how involved do I need to be? And, I think it depends on how prepared you were to start. If you looked through the program and you knew what was being taught, 
you know, most likely if you have an experienced DA or DAs, um, you'll know if they're going to be feeling qualified to be able to train on that from the get-go by themselves, or do you need to be maybe on site? I will say for myself, but it's just who I am. I wanted to see the process from start to finish myself to start, not, not because I didn't trust the person. Um, the person who started the school with me is now actually a doctor with me here in my office. So um, isn't that crazy? I know. Um, but my point being like, it wasn't that I didn't trust her. It was that I wanted to see the process from start to finish because I just cared so much about what was being turned out as a product. So you can be hands-on or you can be hands-off. But you know, in a nutshell, this program is a 13-week, pretty fast-paced curriculum um, you can run three to four programs a year if you so choose, depending on your demographic. You can run four, but they will be back to back to back to back, obviously. That's tough. I can say from experience, that is a little bit tough. We actually only run two now, just due to where I live, that works the best. But, um, you know, you can run as many, you can run up to four if you so choose. Um, usually per class, you'll always want to have anywhere between four and 12. That's usually where it ends up being kind of the most profitable and what you can have one to two teachers um, be able to help with. It is 50% online, which helps cut down on overhead, which we'll talk about. Um, but when you have that lab portion of the class, if you have more than six to eight students, sometimes it's worthwhile to have that second teacher. People ask, what do you pay those teachers? I usually suggest time and a half um, for their position. Um, and obviously somebody who's just really enthusiastic about teaching. Um, but yeah, fast paced, 13 weeks, 50% online, 50%, you know, in, in your office. Um, anything that I forgot there though? I just want to, I just want to add to the fact that because A, it's 50% online and uh, uh, B, you know, we're back to the, you know, entry, the, the, the barrier to entry as far as cost, you're really also getting to target um, a demographic that might not have been able to attend school and like change careers or even consider changing careers um, because, you know, maybe they have a full-time job and they don't have time to go to traditional um, school, you know, maybe they're needing evening classes. And, and so I think it gives you a wider berth of demographic of different types of people that you can, you can attract um, into the dental field. And I can't tell you the number of students I got that were, um, that were, like, hey, I've, I've been working in banking forever and I just need to do something completely different, but I work nine to five. Well, perfect. Classes start at 530, you know? Yep. And so, um, it you know, it can be totally, you can be uh, working with individuals who might not have access um, to those uh, courses anyway. Um, I have a couple of questions here too. Sure. Uh, uh, we have one that says, what systems and software do you use for student tracking, payments, grades, and, in, and is all of that in the packet? Do you guys guide them on what you guys use for that? Yeah, so I mean, we really do just use electronic records for everything online, but um, usually it's all Excel stuff, Google Docs, things like that. But yes, we give you some samples that you can use. Um, for us, keeping everything digital was much easier than trying to keep anything paper-wise. You can, you can keep paper files, but Oh, no, no, you can't, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to veto that even as a suggestion. No, well, not, not allowed. We've, in this ha we've had a few people who want to, and we say you can do what you want, but I will say keeping it online is way easier when you need to send it to the state. Um, when the state comes and does a site inspection, it's also easier if everything's just digital, but just so you know, they do accept paper ones. So I'm just going to, I don't know. We're not even going to put that into the universe. Just delete that. Don't I'm even not allowing it. I am not allowing you, it. You can, you can. <laughs> Ashley will punch you in the face. I am not, nope, not allowed. <laughs> um, another question we had to have you guys ever had to transfer the school ownership um, if you guys uh, sold a practice? Like, you know, have you, have you ever dealt with anything like that? And what does that look like? I haven't. Um, I don't, I mean, I would assume you would negotiate that as a separate thing. Yeah. So I uh, work with a doc and so he just sold his practice, but he is keeping control of the dental assistant school. And so what he did was he negotiated, um, uh, rent, um, for the time that he's doing in the lab. Again, all of the lectures are online. So you're not having to be inside mm -hmm. of a dental clinic to do the, um, no, not the lab. The lecture is all online. 
So you only have to be in office for the lab portion, but yeah, they kept it uh, separate to still run um, because I mean, it's still a profitable business and something that, um, you know, was, was working out. So that's what they did. Um, but I have also worked in uh, situations where they have, you know, added that in as part of the sale and have transferred ownership with that as well. And then the only things that need to be done is to reach out to the state board of private post-secondary education and, you know, share ownership change and that. Type. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think for some people, it depends on whether you want to continue the, the program or whether you want to potentially sell it, which would be negotiated as, as a different LLC, a separate business, but I haven't personally dealt with it. So it's good you have. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Good questions, Kay. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, another question that I have is, how do you pick the night? Can you do it on the weekend? And I'm like, you can do anything you want. We've switched it on the night based on really our own schedule. You just have to make sure that whatever class is coming in, you keep it consistent by and large. Um, so if you have it on Thursday night to start the class by and large, keep it always on Thursday nights. Not to say though, if you have a second or third session that you couldn't change it, um, based on the practice needs. Some practices are, they do really well with Saturdays. You have to know your demographic. Um, for some people that 13 weeks doing it on Saturdays works really well. I've also heard people try to double up on Saturdays to try to actually get through more curriculum. That is state dependent. Sometimes they have parameters around that. So um, I would say use what, it make, what makes sense for you. For me, it all came down to my teachers. My teachers personally didn't want to work on Saturdays just due to everybody knows where I live. So that didn't work well here. Um, but for some people, as you know, Ashley, it works really well to have Saturdays. I've also known people who do a weeknight class and a Saturday class. They were in the position to be able to run two classes at once. Oh, yeah. So, you know, because there's some people who it's the same type of thing. And I mean, that that is a testament to the amount of, of you know, energy they were putting into the school too that's marketing to get you know enough students in that's having the good teachers that's um but they were able to make it work and um did it for several years yeah yeah and I guess if you love it and you have that many people who want to teach I think I mean wow that's amazing um well and speaking of when it comes to overhead that's one of the most common questions I get is how profitable is it and things like that well, I love to look at overhead, of course, as well on programs like this, hence the fact we made it 50% online because, you know, for us, it just made better sense to do that. Um, but the biggest things that, you know, of course, our expenditures are, of course, payroll. Um, the more teachers, the more cost. But that being said, you've got to be thoughtful of, you know, the student to teacher ratio. Um, marketing of course, is one of the higher ones, I would say. Um, and website used to be one of them, but thankfully with, with CMO share, we, we've made it to where um, that's actually quite a bit more um, affordable as well. So I would say what I've no normally seen in offices, even with really high marketing budgets, it usually ends up being between 20 and 50% for overhead. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. I think that's what, uh, you know, our schools are running to is about 20 to 50 ish, depending on, especially in the beginning, right? Like you're going to be marketing more in the beginning. Let me tell you though, too, word of mouth with these types of things, especially, you know, it, it's like a dental office. It's, oh, you know, the number of grandmas you have in your chair who are like, oh, my granddaughter needs to take this yep. course or my daughter needs something to do, or, you know, my son is looking to change careers. You know, it's, um, you know, there's a ton of word of mouth stuff that goes on. So even promoting it within your dental practice and letting people know that you're using, you know, what you have started in your dental practice, promoting, you know, even sending out email blasts, that type of thing to mm -hmm. your a patient membership. Hey, if you guys know anyone, you know, yeah. utilize that information. You're not starting from scratch. You have a patient base um, that has connections that is looking for this type of, uh, that's looking for this type of course. Absolutely. Well, and the good news is, is the demographic who tends to not always, but tends to be gravitates towards this sort of program is a lot on social media. So there are ways to, you know, that we can help you to kind of have ideas for things to put on social media as well, um, including your own following. Because much like you said, we use our own patient base, especially social media wise for things like that too. Because you're right, people know people. And especially if you're in a community where you're well-known and established, it doesn't take long for your word to get out for sure. But when it comes to overhead, you can expect, yes, I agree. 
that first year, it might be a little bit closer to the 4050, but then it does, as you start to um, get a few classes under your belt, word of mouth, people signing up, yeah, it, it definitely goes back down into the 20s and 30s for a lot of people. So, um, which I know is important for a lot of doctors to consider when they're doing this. Um, the one thing that I do get questions about a lot is, is there any EFTA training, expanded function type training? That's a separate program in most states. They have a whole separate curriculum. So at this time, we don't offer that. That is something though, that once they do this program, and they have the certification, it actually makes it to where in most states, once they accumulate the amount of hours needed, they can take the certification from the school plus their hours and submit that to the EFTA program. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have EFTA. Um, we do not have nitrous either, as that's usually a state specific thing. Um, the radiology, we are actually working currently on our radiology that's in the program itself is accepted by the majority of the states, but we have found now a couple states have to have a completely separate radiology program. So we are working on a curriculum right now as we speak actually to be able to add an addendum to that for the states that need that as well. So when students are done, they are x-ray certified. You will have them CPR certified. That comes within the course as well. Um, the course doesn't do it but you bring a provider on site to get them CPR certified. And then they'll have their, their um, dental certification, DA certification as well that they can have. Some states, as you know, need that on file. Some states don't, like Colorado is a state that they don't have to have that certification, but it works really well if they ever move and they need to transfer it to a different state that does. Gotcha. So are they doing the, like the Danby um, test after this? Yep, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, and depending on the state, like we had one who moved to Montana and that's exactly what she did. She okay. took her certification and was able to apply for that because states are really, that's what's hard is, as you know, to have a curriculum that's perfect for everything for everywhere is a little okay. tough. It, yeah. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen kind of like paper records. It's not going to happen. Nope, not so. to you can draw your lines too. I get it. <laughs> Uh, I'm like, I'm trying to be PC. I'm like, you can. Um, but I'm trying to think if there's anything else. But yeah, like a few states like New Jersey, California, Florida, Maryland. Maryland. Those are some of the states that are a little bit tougher. Maryland, whoo, Maryland, but a little bit tougher. Um, but then they also need kind of that separate radiology type stuff, which normally what happens in those states is they have to do a curriculum like this and then go take a separate radiology course. So it's almost like the students there have to do both. We're in the works with creating one right now with a doctor in New Jersey to make it to where we'll have that program as well. Um, so yeah, like I said, some states that are a no-go, North Dakota for sure. I feel like Washington, D.C. is a, that one's a no-go. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all. Uh, have you guys ever done any in New York? <laughs> New York is pretty, pretty tough. Um, yes, yeah, what I always told people was, was that it's, it's not a no go, but you're going like, you're looking at a very lengthy in debt. Like, how bad do you want this? <laughs> yep. Yep. It's going to cost them extra just due to the number of hours, but then just, just to apply is $8,000 in New York. Oh, so, yeah. yep. We've had ones there too. And we say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> how far do you want to go with this? Because our team will give up to 20 hours to help with that certification process, anything after that. And some of the states they know like, hey, this is a, this one's a doozy. How much, how much is it worth it to you? So, um, well, and go ahead. I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to make you go state by state, but the other big one that I've dealt with before was California. Are you guys, is so California actually isn't as bad as it used to be, but the only bummer with California is they got so backed up during COVID. Um, we have a couple doctors, literally everything's done. They're just waiting because they're backed up by one year through the licensure process. Mm -hmm. So yeah, California is not an easy state, but it's not un not doable. Same with Florida. Like we have a couple doctors that have gotten the program through. It's just more tedious, I would say. So um, as far as, yeah, I think we've kind of discussed when to not own a school. Um, if you think that this is going to be like your primary source of income, eh, I wouldn't say that it's a really great source of income, especially like Ash said, 
you know, when you're utilizing your space, when it's not open anyway, um, I would say, let me think. Yeah. If you just want it for like just passive income, you don't want to have to think about it. One thing I would say is you can get to that place, but I would highly recommend being involved in the beginning to make sure that it is, you know, it has its own P and L you should be looking at. It has its own stuff you should be looking at. Um, but it does get passive. Yes, for sure. Um, I think if I you think don't have, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. I was like, I, I think if you don't have, if you don't have somebody teaching it that you would want to replicate them, that's the, probably not a good, that's not good. <laughs> um, you don't want somebody teaching it that you're like, this is not the person I want to emulate over and over in my office. Yep. Yeah. What were you, what were you going to say? And, uh, you know, back to, I think, you know, if you, it's not, it's a great source of income, but the, like, I think just one of the most valuable things again, is the cherry picking of those assistants. I think almost like putting the time and energy into creating this program and being able to have those rock star assistants that then usually grow throughout the organization. Um, Dr. Costas has a few uh, assistants uh, like Claudia, who's now running a billing company, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, started it and his day, DA school, like, uh, like you, it's, it's just so valuable in the types of people that you can, again, just kind of cherry pick from, like, I feel like that's worth the investment alone. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and like you said, a lot of the people who join these programs, you know, one, we make the interview process such that, and this is us, we make the interview process that we would rather believe it or not have fewer students that are super committed than way more students that aren't committed, don't really come, because it's honestly more of a headache and it's harder. So for us, if you give us six really committed students and we can pick three of them to be in the offices, it's a huge win. It's a win for them and it's a win for us. It's a win for the community too. Um, I will say I get calls constantly still from doctors who all, all around my area who are like, any chance you have anybody, you know, any, it's so, it's so nice to know that other doctors have sent their own assistance. People are wanting to hire, but don't have the time to train. They've actually done that. Um, that was a way I marketed in the very beginning was I went around to those doctors and I said, you know, hey, if you have somebody who's a great customer service fit, culture fit, you love them, but you want them to get some of the training so you don't have to, you can send them here. Um, and that became really popular and almost zero marketing budget. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many upsides to it. If you have the right people, you have an admin team, you know, you're okay with maybe jumping through some of the hurdles. Um, I have, I have been really grateful, especially in the last three years. I'm really grateful to have had it for sure, because you're right. Some of our very favorite people have come from that school and they've gone on, which is really cool to be hygienists. Like I said, I have a doctor working here right now as we speak who started the school with me. So it is really kind of this like fulfilling thing that's cool to see your team has growth potential because they enjoy it. They enjoy not just the extra money, they enjoy having influence in an industry that I think they're passionate about too. So yeah, so many upsides, but definitely some things to be aware of as well. So I think if you have the time, I think if you have the people, um, you have the space um, and in your demographic, there's a need. You can see the need it honestly may be something you want to consider, especially with what's coming down the pike with the economy. I think there's going to be more and more and more people looking to join the stability of something like a dental office. So absolutely, absolutely agree. Well, Dr. Casmo, if you know, we do have listeners who are interested in your program, where can they find more information? So the easiest place to go is daschools.com. And if you go to daschools.com, you're going to be able to click on I'm a doctor. And it will actually take you to sample curriculums. And then there's a little form that if you want more information, you want to find out if your territory is available, you put your information in there. And Amanda and Melissa and Sarah should get back to you usually within 24 hours or so. Okay. I absolutely love that. I absolutely love that. Awesome. Well, anything else? I know. I don't think so. Anything else that you know just as well as I did? Anything we failed to discuss that... Um people tend to have questions about. I, I, 
I don't, I don't think so. I mean, we are available inside of DSN. Um, oh, I do have someone, uh, Tammy, if you want to shoot your question in the Q and a, uh, down there at the bottom, we can, uh, go ahead and answer that, um, or shoot us in a workplace after this. Um, I see you have your hand raised, but can't you have to shoot it in the, in the bottom there. Um, oh, is it required to be a dentist? That's a really great question. So I think a dentist has to oversee it, but here's what I will tell you is I don't think that means a dentist has to own it. So yeah. we've had people who the assistant owned the entity, but the doctor was like the overseer of it. Cause a lot of times that the doctor has to just be able to say, you know, yes, they're there to handle questions and things like that. So, yeah. So what we, uh, what we listed it as, uh, so Tammy, if you're if you're working with a, a dentist, yes, like hey, have a have a collaborative agreement, like hey, you know, can I utilize this space and pay you rent, that type of thing. Um, and as Dr. Casmel mentioned, you know, when you're applying with the state, um, we would list like the doctor who maybe wasn't running it as the clinical director. Um, and so the you know, again, you have a dentist name on it, he's approved the approved the curriculum. Um, and is ready to to roll. But yeah, you can um, either partner with a dentist or, you know, if you are maybe know a dentist and you're like, hey, how can we work this out to where I'm utilizing your offers, office in the downtime? Um, we have seen that work in the past. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, obviously, if you're interested, let us know. And we are available within DSN as well. But um, thank you, Ashley. I was like, what a fun one for you and I to do together because it's how we met. So yeah. The other thing I have to selfishly plug too slightly is the Please. reason I came on to to help Dr. Costas as his executive assistant um, was to help run the dental assistant school. So as you guys know, I train and hire executive assistants. So if that's something that you're looking for, this is a great thing for them to do uh, is to get your school to be the person who's in charge of all of the documents, to be in charge of answering the phone um, when students call. Kay, who is listening to this right now, used to answer the phone when students would call. So, um, you know, having uh, that type of admin or executive assistant who isn't necessarily tied to the office, but you can hire kind of at an entry level position. Um, this is a great thing for them to yep. do. Too. So. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even think of that because here's what, what's funny is I'm sitting here saying all the people who are doing this right now for me. And your executive Ashley, assistants. <laughs> Ashley literally found those people. So I'm like, yeah, like Amanda, who, you know, very well, I'm like. They, they are the people that definitely run not just my own school within my, um, you know, my office, but they also run the program that we sell to doctors across the country. And it, the paperwork part, that logistical kind of, you know, paperwork stuff in that first four to six months is perfect for an admin assistant. And I'm not just saying this because I'm your friend, but you are like a magician at it. So you find such great assistance. So truly, if that's something you're in need, which most doctors I talk to are, um, yes, for sure. Ashley's your, your person. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, this was super fun. I feel like it's a very like full circle moment, right? Since that how that's how we met. So um, again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out inside of DSN um, or visit Dr. Casmel's website. Um, yeah. And we awesome. will see you next month with another Lady Leaders. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Right, Bye.